Greetings and welcome to Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungubanda, your host on this channel. Our guest today is someone with a diverse and rich background in terms of experience, sectors, but also areas of interest. He is an economist and a mathematician. He's a teacher who became a banker. He is a sports person who once captained the under 17 national volleyball team. His name is Mr. Simangolwa Shakalima. He's the current managing director for Invest Trust Bank Zambia PLC. This is the role he took up in 2016 after having worked for Barclays Bank, now Absa Bank, for 15 years. While in Barclays Bank, he served as Chief of Staff and Head of Strategy for Southern Africa. He was also Director for Retail and Consumer Banking. In addition to his former role in Invest Trust Bank, Mr. Shakalima is the Vice Chairman for the Bankers Association of Zambia. Mr. Shakalima, welcome to Zambition. Oh, thank you so much, Martin, and it's a, it's a great honor for me, uh, you know, to be having this dialogue with you. Uh, you are doing a great job and, uh, uh, you know, we, I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's our honor to have you on the program. And I would like to invite you to show or describe an image that best reflects who you are and the journey you have walked so far. What might that be? Well, I, I think I looked around and uh, I do have one actually, and I'm just hoping it will not be an orthodox, uh, but, uh, you know, I decided to use this. It's a laptop, but I think let's just uh, generally call it a computer. Uh, I think a computer describes my journey. A computer has four basic functions, data input, processing, output, as well as storage of information. So when I look at my journey, really, um, starting from my, my, my early years, you know, I was born to, uh, to, to, to uh, a couple of teachers uh, my mother was a, was a primary school teacher. She rose all the way up to being a headmistress. And my father was a lecturer. Uh, uh, and you, you mentioned mathematics. He was actually a lecturer in mathematics. Uh, and uh, he rose up to the position of vice chancellor for a teacher training college. Uh, so, you know, growing up in that environment where you're coming from, uh, you know, from both parents being teachers, I was always interested in academics. Uh, so I started my journey quite early in terms of academics. So through primary, I had access to books and things like that. Uh, so, so I think throughout my academic journey, uh, there was always that issue of processing information, making it meaningful. How can I challenge myself to do even better in terms of grades uh, and things like that? So I was always probably in the top five. Uh, if I say I was number one, I would be exaggerating, but uh, at any given point in time, <laughs> through primary into secondary, I went to Kenisha Secondary School. Oh, I love that school. And then went to university to do economics. So that's on the academic side. Uh, but guess what? I think life is more about, it is more than academics, you know? So I got involved in sports from grade six, you know, and one of my teachers, Mr. Chiongo, then he's now Dr. Chiongo, uh, introduced me to volleyball in grade six and I excelled at it. Uh, even at secondary school, we became national champions, uh, then got involved uh, in the under-17 national team and under-21, uh, did some accolades there. Even at university, uh, I was captain and chairman for the volleyball team, you know, so again, you know, great exploits in that area. Uh, the last one I wanted to share is also on the religious side. Um, you know, I belong to Seventh-day Adventist Church and from childhood got involved in youth activities, Adventist youth, uh, we're doing several programs, uh, activities, uh, you know, the, doing plays, uh, citing verses, reciting verses and, and things like that. So that's why I, I think a computer 
describes my journey very well. Uh, you know, so I think God has endowed us with a lot in our brains, uh, and sometimes we limit ourselves. So the reason I'm sharing that is, is because I think I've discovered that there are a lot of things we can do, uh, including, uh, you know, across different aspects of life uh, that, uh, you know, we can achieve a lot once we apply ourselves in all different areas of life. So I, I hope that sums why I chose a, a computer for that reason. <laughs> That's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, because you somehow in a very accessible manner, you, you help us to understand why these three are important, uh, maybe as we will talk later, to quality and successful leadership. You talk about a health body um, through your, your sporting activities, but you also talk about a health, a healthy mind, uh, applying yourself to learning. But then we are not just mind and body, we are also spirit, hence your spiritual dimension of life. That's, that's a wonderful Absolutely. way of giving us the three important aspects. And I would like to follow up by inviting you to this notion that there are stories that we create, but there are also stories that create us. Kindly share a story or an event when you sensed who you are, when something about yourself shifted or opened up, when you felt your own sense of purpose and possibility in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. I think there are a couple of events, but let me pick on this one eh? mm -hmm. um, the, the, that, that I feel completely addresses your question. In 2007, while I was working at uh, Barclays Bank, uh, at the time I was country product and marketing manager. Uh, one of the things we tried to do for the bank uh, was um, uh, sort of, you know, make ourselves top of mind uh, to the people. We were coming from a, a period where we had shrunk uh, branches and, and things like that. So I think there was a question around how can we remain top of mind? Uh, and, and apart from just general promotion of products and services, uh, I did share an idea with the management team at the time led by um, Danny Nell. And one of the things I said is, can we probably look at doing a TV program uh, that we can, since we're financial intermediaries as a bank, that can help us discuss economic issues, uh, but at the same time, also begin to showcase uh, you know, some of the things that we do as a bank, uh, which invariably are an answer to some of those economic challenges. Uh, so I coined a program called Economic and Financial Matters. Uh, so discussed with ZNBC, uh, put it together, uh, and uh, you know it was agreed that we could do it. Uh, and then because I originated it, uh, I actually said, I'd probably be better off to anchor it. Uh, so I, I didn't have broadcasting knowledge and things like that. So we did the 101 in the ZNB studios, ran a couple of tries, and uh, the guys were impressed said, well, I think we can go for it. So that's how we brought up that program uh, called Economic and Financial Matters. And I was, the, I was the main anchor. But that's not what I wanted to share. Yeah. What I wanted to share is in the midst of that, uh, there was a time I was coming from church. It was a nice Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. So I was going home uh, and my car had gone for service. So uh, I'd borrowed a van uh, from, um, from a Nissan hard body from, from the office. Uh, then as I was about to, um, to enter the, the gate, so I hooted at the gate. Lo and behold, before my young brother came to open, uh, a, a small car parked behind me. Uh, and before I knew it, within seconds, guns out, they came to the door. Um, you know, so that's how I allowed them in. They bundled me within the van and drove off. Uh, so they started communicating uh, you know, within the car and said, uh, you know, uh, we've gotten the car, you know. So they asked me, is it uh, petrol or diesel? I said, oh, it's petrol. Ah, I wanted it diesel. So they took me all the way to the bush. I only discovered later that uh, I was living in Chadley then. I only discovered later after taking a walk that it was actually, it was actually uh, Kanakatapa Road where they dropped me off and I had to walk uh, for some couple of kilometers before going to the roadside. 
So the reason I'm sharing this is yeah. you're in the midst of a career, it's looking good, you're doing well, you've got a young family, everything is, is, is looking bright. Then all of a sudden you're hijacked like that. Uh, before they left me, they'd actually pointed a gun to my head, almost discussing among us themselves whether they needed to kill me or not, you know, at the time. Uh, they got away with my laptop and so on, and they, they, they let me go. Uh, I didn't know where I was, I had to walk a number of kilometers. But at that point, then I realized my purpose, uh, because we tend to take things for granted in life. Um, you know, so it dawned on me that uh, we have all these blessings, uh, you know, we, we, we have all these career aspirations and so on. But you know what? Life can be taken away from you in a minute, you know? Yeah. So then you start saying, so if I had gone that time, I mean, this was like 2007, right? This is uh, 2021, <laughs> you know, this is 14 years later. So my life would have been taken away 14 years ago, you know? What would have been my legacy? What would I have left for my family? What impact would I have made, you know, to the people around me, you know, the extended family, uh, church mates, society at large. So I think it changed my perspective of life and just saying each day that you live is actually a blessing and make it count. So don't waste away years, you know, as a result of carelessness, as a result of not paying attention to things. So I think that was a, a, a change. It was a, it was a life changing moment for me. Since then, uh, I think, I no longer view the number of hours in a day as a limitation, but as an opportunity to make a difference. So I think it helped me even from my career, you know, the attitude just changed, uh, you know, they want to interact with people. There's no need for me, you know, to, to be stressed, uh, you know, about uh, certain situations. Actually, I should be removing the stress and helping others. So I don't know if it gives you a picture, Martin, but, uh, you know, I've never been the same after that experience. I used to go to church, but, uh, you know, after that, I started really going to church, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, because of that same experience. Relationships changed, perspectives changed, attitude changed. Gosh, what a story. And, and also, thank God your life was spared, that we can leave this moment for me to learn about that profound story. That is a story that shaped you, that made you. Among yes. many, but certainly that that stands out. And thank you for also letting us in. Uh, as you use words such as, I used to go to church, but now I really, really go to church. <laughs> Distinguishing the difference between just doing a role as you one would perfunctorily do, but in, in the case of really doing it, it's a different ballgame. Mr. Shakalimba, I would like to invite you to reflect on your current role in the finance and banking sector. Just like education, access to finance is one of the key passports, key passports to the activation of human talent and resourcefulness and banks are central to people's access to finance among many other roles you have in our society and in the business sector you are vice chairman of the bankers association of zambia how can we enable every zambian have access to the finance that is patient enough to allow ideas to blossom into reality. Mm -hmm. That's quite loaded, Martin, uh, but thanks for uh, asking, because it's usually, when you're discussing with bankers, it's usually the elephant in the room, uh, you know, as the term would go. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's so key uh, and central to why we exist as banks. So if we start with the role that the banking sector plays, uh, I always say that uh, as bankers, we try to complicate what we do. Uh, obviously, it's probably just for esteem purposes, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, in terms of what we do, it's just financial intermediation. So we are mopping up funds uh, from those that do not have immediate use for it at that particular time. 
reward those that bring in large sums of money uh, and then redistribute it to areas that need finance. Uh, so, so we're sort of matchmakers, uh, so to speak. Uh, so it's important, yes, that we respond to, to the need uh, that is quite real in terms of offering finance. Uh, now, I think as we address what we can do in that space, it's probably better to start with the, some of the challenges that are there in offering the finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say that, uh, uh, you know, with, without really uh, demeaning people uh, and offending them, that banks are also just in business, uh, just like someone who is selling on, you know, carpenter and tomatoes on the street. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's just that, you know, what is our commodity as banks is money. <laughs> you know, so, so, it's a, so it's a shop that deals with money. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, we should be seen from that perspective that, you know, banks are actually businesses. So when I'm CEO there, I'm actually running a business. Uh, so to, to, to the extent that, uh, you know, the, the profit motive is still existent, even in, the, in this particular case. So some of the issues that tend to be there uh, are, are things to do with, if I'm going to give someone money, they need to demonstrate that they have a plan, that they're going to put it to good use and at the end of the day, pay back uh, because then it revolves and then we're able to support others in the process. So I think the biggest um, challenge has been that risk of uh, non-repayment uh, from the recipients of, of the funds. So this is why, for instance, we keep demanding for, can you have three years of audited financials and, and things like that? But I think we are slowly beginning to understand our market to a point where you know, banks are able to take a, a slightly better risk than we have done in the past. And I think we're beginning to demonstrate this. So if you look at where the credit has gone to, it's basically gone to government, it's gone to large corporations, it's gone to individuals, and individuals are mostly salaried because uh, all these are considered, uh, a, you know, manageable risk to an extent. So where do we have a challenge? It's mostly around the small and medium enterprises. Uh, that's why we have the biggest challenge. So I think, you know, in terms of addressing this particular one, uh, I think we, we've made significant strides, but we can do a lot more. And one of the things I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, sitting, sitting uh, under, under bars is two things. Mm -hmm. One, the cost of borrowing itself. Yeah. If you are going to borrow at 25 to anything between 25 to 35%, just think about it, Martin. So just say, if you borrow and you are being charged, say 30% per annum, what sort of returns do you need to have to be able to sustain a, you know, a borrowing of 30%? It means your returns, whatever you're doing, selling information you know, or, or whatever it is, must give you more than that 30% in order for it to make sense. So I think the cost uh, of, of, of finance itself needs to be addressed. Uh, and it's not a standalone issue uh, because uh, it's influenced also by policy government policy, through monetary policy, through fiscal policy. So, and I think we, we, we are beginning to address that, uh, you know, from a stability perspective. So, for instance, rates have now come down to around, you know, 25%, uh, 25, 26% in terms of borrowing. But if you can come down further, that would help with the would-be borrowers and also on the side of the banks who are suppliers of that finance, so that when you supply it, you know it's going to, to come back. Yeah. The second aspect, which is the final one, uh, from my side is actually, I think there's um, uh, an emergency of an opportunity that most people haven't grasped, but it's actually growing. Uh, technical assistance intermediaries. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a large term, but all we're saying is there are all these players that are in the market, you know, can we have intermediaries in between the financial institutions uh, and the market players? Some intermediaries who can help with educating uh, the, um, the, the borrowers, the would-be borrowers, but also giving them assistance so that they, need, you know, they can assure the financial institutions and lenders that uh, you know, we sit on their boards, uh, you know, we look at their business plans, uh, and therefore you know, give comfort to the lenders. So I think it's an Im emerging area that, uh, that people should, should actually manage. Uh, and probably one final thing, I, I know I said finally, but one final thing, uh, you know, is cooperatives. You've heard the, the, you know, the, the, the discussion around cooperatives. The issue there is there is power 
input resources, you know. If, you know, look, I can be doing chickens uh, at my small farm uh, and I can only do 500, but ShopRite probably requires, uh, you know, 3,000 beds a day or whatever number. So if we came together, you know, with the people who are in that sort of business and say, can we come together, uh, assure, uh, you know, um, these off-takers around guaranteed, uh, you know, supply, then all of a sudden we are empowering each other. The challenge sometimes we have in Zambia is each one wants to fight on their own, in your own small corner. But I think if people came together and cooperate so it is organized, if you want to borrow, there's a track record of contracts you have, suppliers, uh, off-takers, then it becomes easier for everybody, uh, you know, to deal, uh, to expand, but also to have access to finance. Thank you. And as you talk about cooperatives, I think you are on to something very interesting there. Um, allow me to just uh, go back a little bit to where you began from. Sure. I do hear you when you say banks are just like any other business. But would you also include in that description of banks as any other business, the fact that because you deal in a product or service where we don't have many alternatives, money, Mm -hmm. which for me I regard as blood is to the body. The life of our bodies depends on the supply of blood and money finance to an economy is as such. And that's why it is permissible across the world that we don't allow our financial institutions to fail. And sometimes governments even intervene to breathe life into financial institutions because they in turn give life. Then to that extent, you are in a very different kind of business. Yes, I agree, it's business, but it's business of a different kind. You are the lifeblood of the economy. And therefore, shouldn't we be inviting you to even greater creativity. And that's where I liked your notion of cooperatives. Look at the Grameen model of mm -hmm. banking. Mm -hmm. It took someone to understand that the unbankable can be bankable if they are organized in a particular way. Shouldn't the Bankers Association of Zambia, in the way you mentioned yourself, be involved in more innovative rather than traditional ways of allowing everyone who is economically active to access finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Martin. I, I probably couldn't have put it better than you have uh, in terms of just describing the role that the financial um, uh, system plays uh, and the financial sector players, especially us as banks. Uh, I think you referred to the Grameen model which basically relies on trusted networks. Remember how it works. People come together, uh, probably they're in a the market, you know, you're all traders, you guarantee each other. Uh, so that in cases, uh, uh, you know, there's non-performance, the whole group comes together. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so that's what I'm talking about as well. Uh, and there is no better way than managing it via vehicles like cooperatives, for instance. But uh, to the extent that we've made progress, I think you would have seen that uh, credit has really expanded, especially in the last five years, um, to the private sector. Uh, and most of it, apart from just handling large corporates um, and, and, and government institutions, we are beginning to, um, to see inroads in terms of value chains. So, so for instance, on the copper belt, you, know, you are dealing with a mine. The mine has miners. Uh, they have canteens, just as an example. You've got people who are producing food to supply to the mine so that the miners are fed and, and things like that. So we've started seeing value chain financing uh, at the moment. Zambia breweries, they've got various uh, people who, who supply them with different things, just as an example. Uh, the cement industry you know, has got value chains. And I think we're beginning to see banks going into that space uh, because then you can look at uh, you know, the, the parent industry and the players and downstream. Uh, and I think that's where the innovation is, is coming from. Uh, but you know, you and I are also concerned 
not just about medium-sized businesses, but even the smaller ones. Absolutely. And I think that's where we can make the biggest difference. And remember, this uh, country has youthful people, you know, who are desperate to touch something. They've got the energy. Uh, it's just that the finance is a letdown. And I think that's where, uh, you know, I, things like, you know, getting organized by cooperatives, associations become so key. Uh, there are people who do cross-border trading. They, they, they import apples. Uh, and other products, you know, from, you know, down South Africa and other places. Come together, organize yourselves. There's a full track record. Who are you supplying? There's a record to that effect. Then we can come in, uh, you know, to offer finance uh, from that perspective. So I like the, the angle you brought. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a meeting of minds, basically, where we're just saying, you know, there's actually opportunity if people get a bit more organized than going the solo route. Absolutely. And Mr. Shakalima, what is your ambition? What is your highest aspiration for our country, if I may add? And what is it that currently stands in the way of that ambition you see you have? Well, I think when it comes to the ambition, um, let me start from the economic standpoint. Eh? I'm biased. Uh, so you 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 can understand, uh, you know, fundamentally, all countries, all individuals, all businesses uh, are involved in the uh, goods and services, you know, production and distribution of goods and services. I think that's what we all do across the world, you know. It's just that some do it better than others, you know, and and some add value, others, you know, do raw. So I think. When it comes to the factors of production, we've got land, you know, land itself and uh, minerals and things like that. Then you come to labor, which is where you and I play a role, you know, the effort we bring in, you know. So you've got land, your minerals and so on, you, you know, you, um, you, you earn rent. You've got labor, you, you know, it's, uh, it's wages. Then you come to capital, which is just machinery, tools and so on. What do you earn their interest? And I think for me, the last part, which is entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. is where my ambition lies. Uh, if you look at these three factors, uh, I, you know, I, I think you know, we are almost there, though we can do a lot more under capital. But it's the entrepreneurship side. Uh, and for you to just remember, I know you've had various conversations. Let me put it this way. My ambition is ERP. 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 Entrepreneurship rich Zambia, you know. <laughs> Entrepreneurship rich Zambia, and I think this is where we can make a real difference because uh, I think we've all identified the opportunities. We are mining copper, exporting it. You know, can we do something to that copper? Uh, you know, we produce maize and things like that. Meanwhile, we are importing cornflakes. You know, so so I think you know we produce cotton. We we are importing second hand clothes. Uh, you know, so, so I think that that's where, for me, the greatest is ambition lies, uh, if we can encourage entrepreneurship. And as banks, we actually play a big role in supporting innovation and Absolutely. entrepreneurship. Because then, how do you organize all this? You've got these resources, uh, you've got the people, how do you upskill them? Uh, you know, this is why I subscribe to some of the issues around educating, sub supporting education, uh, you know, investment in infrastructure, uh, and the uh, and, and, uh, industries, you know, can we have a vibrant manufacturing sector? Uh, then we can, you know, then we can start supporting all these linkages. So I'm looking forward to an entrepreneurship rich Zambia where we can upskill the people, we can have investments into multi facility economic zones, manufacturing, get all these engines running. Uh, then we can talk about a prosperous Zambia. Fantastic. And coming back to the aspect of leadership, and because you have at various levels and in various dimensions practiced and are continuing to practice leadership at the highest level in organized systems, where do you as a leader make a difference and where do you struggle? Hmm. requires a bit of reflection, but, uh, but really, Martin, I think for me, the way I make the greatest difference is developing people. Um, 
Uh, I think it, I just don't say it, I actually do it. Uh, I think my greatest satisfaction, uh, you know, has been the way I've led my teams and, and, and uh, let the people succeed. Um, I am a firm believer in the fact that uh, any organization is as good as as these people. Uh, So uh, I think you'll find that whether at at Barclays now, APSA, where I used to be, and even now at Invest Trust, uh, I think if there's anything that I would be remembered for, is for having developed uh, leaders in the process. Developing other leaders or leaders around you, that's phenomenal. My last question, Mr. Shakalima, what is the most valuable among many other pieces of advice you have been given what is the most valuable piece of advice you have ever received yeah i I think it's more it's less professional but more personal the greatest mark of a successful person is the inheritance they leave for their grandchildren Mm. not children but grandchildren. Most of us tend to focus on what, you know, developing ourselves and then just saying, okay, what inheritance do I leave for my children? But the greatest mark of a successful person is going the next level down, which is what inheritance am I leaving for my grandchildren? Because that also rhymes and indeed with the notion of long-term thinking that we can plan even for the times in which we will not live, knowing very well that our grandchildren or our grandchildren's grandchildren will be there. And that's what allows societies to plan long-term. And we have multiple examples across uh, Mm. Africa. For instance, some people would argue that that's how the pyramids were built. They couldn't have been built in one or two generations. But it needed leaders, as you are speaking, who saw far into the future, but began to act in the present. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. And more so, thank you for sharing with us one personal experience that has tremendously shaped you, not only into the person you are today, but also into the leader that our finance sector is experiencing at this moment. I'm grateful, Martin. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged out of that dialogue. Take time to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing. And pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. What are the feelings? What are the thoughts that are ignited by you looking at the painting? What thoughts, feelings, and images does this painting evoke in you with regard to the future of our country? What else does this painting make you think and feel? Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love, on the future of our nation, 